Welcome back, everybody, to the Uncensored CMO. In this episode, I'm joined by Alessandra Bellini. She is the CMO for Tesco, the biggest grocery retailer in the UK. I caught up with Alessandra to find out what it's like running such a big organisation and doing the marketing for a business that has such a big impact on the lives of British consumers. Something like one in seven pounds that gets spent in the UK goes into a Tesco till. What are they doing about the cost of living crisis at the moment? How do they cope through lockdown? And what are they doing to advertise the entire nation and make sure they represent everybody in this great nation? Um, she has so much experience having come from Unilever, doing roles around the world in many different categories, to finding herself here in the UK on Tesco. This is a great episode. She's lots of fun, got so much experience and wisdom. And uh, we even get into a few ads and a few System 1 test results as well, so you can see how it works in reality. Here's my conversation with Alessandra. Alessandra Bellini, welcome to the show. Hello, nice to see you. Now, I, I'd love to know how you got into marketing. How did you end up in this kind of position you're in today? Because you didn't start in marketing, did you? You started in advertising, if I've got that right. I did. I started at 19 years of age out of school. I didn't go to university. I was trying, I was pretending to be at university. And my mother saw an ad in a paper for what we would call today an apprenticeship in advertising. Um, it was 60 places, 2,000 people applied. My mother thought I should be one of them. And I didn't really want to work in advertising, had no clue what I wanted to be. But I did. I got selected. I got a job at Jada Walter Thompson in Milan. And that's how it started. And I thought I found my calling in advertising, which I loved, absolutely loved. I spent 12 years in advertising in Milan. I came to London. I went back to Milan, changed agencies in the, in the while. I mostly worked on Unilever accounts. Not, in not just that, but mostly. Until one day I was asked by the head of the agency I was working for whether I would want to go and talk to the chairman of one of the divisions of Unilever, the personal care one. He was Canadian and he was looking for a marketing director. And I went because I was told to. I didn't have any intention whatsoever to work for a client. But then I did. Wow, <laughs> a month amazing. later, they offered me a job, which was very different to the one I thought I was interviewing for. And the rest is history. I you was don't with hear Unilever. that very often, do you? For some reason, that move is quite rare. I mean, you gave me a flashback, actually. My, my, I, my, my career in advertising didn't last at all, long at all, actually. But I did apply to Saatchi and Saatchi after university years ago. And I'll never forget the um, the application pack because I went, I went to get hold of the application pack and it was really thick. It was 30 pages and they were blank. And I just thought, that's so clever. Like, what do you do when you're like, you, there's no guidance on what they're looking for. You just have to des describe yourself. You've got more space than you need. You could fill it. You could not fill it. I just thought that was very clever. Anyway, but, but I didn't get the job. But uh, <laughs> so. Well, yeah, so it was quite unusual. I was the first one to make a lateral move into Unilever as a, not as a grad, not having business school background, coming from an agency world and being a woman. I had it all. Like, yes. I was yes. racking up all the diversity. You were, tokens. I was going to say. <laughs> that must be quite a change. What, if you put yourself back in that time what did it feel like going from a kind of creative agency into a, what is one of the world's largest most professional you know marketing organizations well my thinking was if they are as crazy as they seem to be to offer me a job then I'm okay you know shows that they're open um, I didn't know at all what I was letting myself in for I don't think they knew either and it took me a while to actually understand what I was doing what my job was there was no predecessor nobody taught me the job it was very much hands-on it was very fraught very hectic um, and I had to learn on the job but uh, luckily I'm a quick learner um, I think for the first year it was really tough and then I kind of got into the hang of it there was a lot of communication development innovation development brand development and so I, I used some of the skills that I'd learned in the previous 12 years I was gonna and say that was very useful that's I have very to say. helpful that isn't was it? very helpful including the fact that I lived abroad that I could speak uh, English very well compared to the rest of the Italians then and that was somehow was was an advantage that allow me to communicate properly rather than just speak. And presumably the creative agencies couldn't pull the wool over your eyes, could they? Because 
because you had the experience no, of how it all um, worked. that's a good point. I was always the best friend or the most or uh, the feared client, <laughs> <laughs> you, you yes. know, because you know all the tricks. And that included knowing how truly, how hard people work in an agency, how much they care about the brands they work on, how much they put all of their passion, all of the time, all of their resources. So I was very respectful and very direct in terms of also what worked and what didn't work. I was very respectful of their time, you know. Yeah. So I think overall I'm a good client, but it's Very for good. them to say yes. <laughs> many years later. Now you had 20 years at Unilever, if I've got that 21, right. 21, yes. 21 years. Very impressive. Um, what, what did you learn in that time and what, what sort of jobs were you doing and what did you learn in that period? I really think I've learned everything about marketing because I didn't really know, didn't have an academic instruction education about it. Um, I worked uh, mostly at the beginning on personal care and home care, which was the division the divisions I joined but over time I also worked on food and ice cream and tea so I've done all of them. I've worked in Italy, in Central and Eastern Europe including Russia and the Baltics and in North America so I've also seen a little bit of developing markets, developed markets, western world and I've just learned to love brands. I mean that magic that happens when you're able to develop craft innovation a brand a communication create a connection with the consumers i think it's it's really amazing and i've learned to love to see how people live even further than just working on the communication part which is why i love marketing so two tricky questions then if you could pick out the most challenging moment in that time and the time that you're most proud of Try and pick those moments because I often think it's, it's interesting. We, we learn the most, don't we, often in the most challenging situations. And obviously we, we remember the things that, that went really well. What would you pick out as your biggest challenge and your biggest success? Yeah, it's easy to point to the mistakes I made. I made many as a marketeer. More often than not, both when I succeeded and when I failed is because I listened to my instinct. And sometimes I didn't listen enough and that was a mistake. And sometimes I was too colour, too optimistic. I didn't look at the... I didn't stress test the ideas strong enough and therefore they didn't actually work in the market. However, I think my worst, um, where I've learned most or in the worst times were when it had to do with people. So when I make mistakes about people, I've learned to regret taking too long to find out um, or not being direct enough or fearing the judgment of the people I had to confront in terms of performance. That's been a huge long life lesson. How do you balance being direct but kind is something that takes a long time. At least took me a long time. And also when I worked in an environment that I didn't feel supported or I didn't feel that I was really getting the best out of my team, myself and the work that we were doing. Those are the dark times, but fortunately, very, very small and very short times. So most of my career I've been so really happy just before you talk lucky. about the good, the good times how what's your advice to somebody that might be struggling with that because that's something i i find difficult is how do you give feedback and often you know don't you you know you're instinctively you know whether someone's doing a good job or not or, or whether that's the right direction to go in but often we make the decision way too late that if we'd made it early it could have avoided lots of heartache what's the secret to you know now you've experienced that what's the secret to kind of talking up early um, someone told me a long time ago that you you should never get really comfortable with it. If you do, there's something wrong. So I accept that it's always uncomfortable, but I have learned not to take too long to decide, even though even by my timings, they may be too long. And I always think that it's not about myself. It's not about me. It's about how they will receive it, how they will hear it and how they will feel it. And however bad you feel about it, it's about them, not about you. And then you just have to be honest and, and kind. I know what, what one bit of advice I got given, which I didn't fully take and I wish I had, was that in the first six months of a new job, you have a window where you tend to see things fairly clearly. You haven't built those relationships or established the kind of, you know, trust with other people. And so you're able to make decisions much more easily when, you know, but you need to have the right level of information so you don't make a knee-jerk reaction and regret it. But equally, if you wait too long, you start to accept, well, this is just how things are. You know, it becomes much, much harder. But I, that's something I definitely learned is, 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 is try and make decisions quickly in a new role before it gets too late. It's true. I think there's, you can look at it both ways. You can wait until you know better and you get to know people better and how the organisation works and what works for the organisation because people are great. Everybody deserves to be brilliant at their job. They just may just be in the wrong organisation, the wrong team or the wrong time. So that 
will err on the side of taking time and learning. And other times you see it clearly, but you just don't want it to be true. So, but anyway, those are, those are things that you learn. Um, and as long as you, I think, remember it's about kindness and it's about respect, uh, not about you, then you just get on with it. So take your 21 years at Unilever. Give me the one high. What's, what's the thing you're most proud of that you, you look back on that time? I have loved nearly every month, day, week of work to Unilever. In fact, throughout my life, I've, I've loved everything I've done. However, my last five years at Unilever, when I was in North America working on ice cream as well as tea, were definitely the most fun. I used to say they pay me to actually think up ice cream flavors <laughs> and innovation on, on ice cream or eat ice cream. And it was the combination of a really, really hard business model, which it is, because it's really hard to make money on ice cream, and a really, really, really fun category where we used to say you can't say ice cream without smiling. It does make you happy, both physically and also mentally. So it was definitely the highlight. It's funny, actually, we, we've done a lot of uh, testing at System 1 on, in the ice cream category, actually. And it's the best performing category. And, and, you know, even just showing ice cream, people like feel good. It's, it's one of those product categories that just makes people smile and feel great. You know, so, so to stand out in ice cream, you have to do really good work. You know, it's very competitive. It is very competitive, very hard, but fun. Yeah, I can well imagine. Very much. Um, so, T- take me from there then. So you went from there to Tesco. So it's quite a change, isn't it? I mean, you're going from obviously global brand owner, very, very marketing led as an organisation, very well respected. And then you, you're you putting yourself in the UK's biggest retailer, ultra competitive category. You know, you're going, I guess you're going, presumably you would have sold to Tesco, wouldn't you? As you know, you want, Tesco must be one of Unilever's biggest customers. And now you find yourself on the customer side. What was that transition like? Well, all of the things you say are true in terms of differences. However, the one thing that was also true is that it's all about people and everyday life. And the things that seemingly don't matter, you know, does it really matter how many yogurts they buy or where they buy them? Probably not. And yet all of these little decisions amount up to something quite fundamental. And that's been the thing that I love as a marketeer. I just love people and watching what they do and and learning about the little things that the little decisions they make about their lives and how each brand including supermarkets can make that life better so that was a common thing and also because of my experience of uh, Unilever I worked on every category so there was a little bit of knowledge that helped me along the way there but you're right it's also very very competitive very fast-paced very hard and immensely elating and addictive so I loved it from the first day. I wanted to ask you about how you get close to your customer, right? Because I think it's one of those core skills, isn't it, for every marketer. But in your case, you know, you're, you're working for an organisation with like 300,000 employees. You must have quite a big team yourself. You, you know, you're doing advertising campaigns every week. You're changing your prices all the time. You know, I, am I right in saying one in seven pounds get spent in Tesco? I knew well. you'd ask me, and I have that, never checked. This is something I, that it's we legend, used to it's say. Legend, it's legend, isn't it? Yes, it's legend. And every that, time you know. I go, I should really check, <laughs> yes, but exactly. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, no. Possibly. Let's say it's still true. You know, the, the percentage of the population that might shop in a Tesco in every, every, any given week is huge, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, I think it's 48 or 49 million transactions a week. It's not the same as people because yeah. some people may go more than once, but that gives you a scale of what happens in a Tesco store every week. Now, and that's a have, lot of people a lot for of you apps. to stay close to and understand. So how do you get close to your customer? So it's really, really, of course, important. <laughs> I think it's one of the reasons why working in retail is amazing, because you can tell right away, immediately, every day, what customers do. Um, where you work as a brand, it takes you a little while, you're a bit removed. But we have several ways to be close to our customers. And, and whilst we have our data, because we have 21 million households on our customer uh, panel. We have actually a customer panel that we've set up, which is robust, um, nationally representative of every cohort, where we can have any conversation, any survey, any test. We have product testing, uh, robust, quantitative and qualitative product testing and assessment. But we also do on a weekly basis, we have qual and quant surveys weekly every weekly week. that we started during the pandemic to be really really close to the mood of the country 
And we decided it was actually too precious to give up. And so on a weekly basis, we will know what's on the customer's mind, uh, what they're thinking about, you know, trust in brands, net optimism, what they think about the government of weather, how worried they are about their finances or what they want to cook, as well as using social media, our customer feedback tools, the national uh, customer pan and all of that. And then also we go in stores. We have something that we call Feet on the Floor, where we all spend some days a year in the stores, in the customer team. We do that more often. So we have direct ways of talking to our customers. We have um, data that shows us what they actually do and also data that shows us and tells us what they say and think. And then we put it all together. It's quite a big machine. I have an amazing team that does that really, really well, but it's so, so important. It must be. I mean, one of the, you know, when I first started in this industry, we, I had to ask someone, what is FMCG? And I had to someone explain it's fast moving. And Tesco is really fast moving, isn't it? The way, you know, way you respond to things all the time. Um, with all the data you've got and, 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 you know, the fact that you're the biggest retailer in the UK, what are the changes you've seen over the last few years? Because it's not as if it's been a quiet few years, right, since you've been running, you know, since you've been the CMO. Not you've really. had a few things to think Just about. Just a few things. So um, what, what, what you, from all the data you collect, what are you seeing in terms of maybe changing shopping habits, changing consumer priorities over that time? Well, it's fair to say both during the pandemic, beginning, middle and end, which lasted a lot longer than we all thought or hoped for, um, and after the pandemic, the changes have been quite seismic. I think if you asked me three years ago, four years ago, what will you see? We just extrapolated a line. And now we've learned that doesn't work. So right now, the last six months, let's say, let's let's take a, we, we see quite marked shifts in behavior. So people have started to shop around much more in search for the best offers, prices, deals or products that they want. We've seen that people are doing all kinds of trading down and trade and trading off and trade offs and choices. So that is from brand to own brand, from the premium own brands to the market entry own brands, from eating out to eating in and cooking, from cooking with a few more ingredients, more refined meals to really simple meals that this starts really it's mind-blowing for me it's now on average six ingredients and it's 11 percent less than it used to be so people not only want to cook for a shorter time to save energy they want to use fewer ingredients they want to on the other hand they could do batch cooking and then you use it and reuse it in different ways so like you know we're all smart savvy people we all make do with what we have and you see that reflected in all of the shopping behaviors there's constant mini choices it's not big things it's mini choices that are made every day in order to make the right trade-offs and put the priorities where each customer feel they need to put it it seems i spent most of my career in soft drinks actually one of the things i noticed in having sort of been through a couple of recessions the trends are not always as obvious as they may seem so the obvious ones would be you know people buying more squash for example because they need to save money but also people were spending more money on premium things because they were eating out less and therefore they wanted to treat themselves in homes so you saw this weird you know value and premium trend all, all kind of happen at the same time so sometimes they're surprising you do see you know, that trends. normally in crisis times of crisis or recessions you see what people describe as the polarization of, of consumption. So you will see a lot of down trading to the more affordable option, whatever that looks like, and also up trading into the more premium offer in a supermarket, which in itself is a down trading for perhaps a more premium supermarket and grocer or eating out. It's all depends on the, on the vantage point where you look at from. So we are seeing that our finest range, for example, is growing by 8%, well ahead of some of the other ranges because of that so when you're at home and you want to entertain whether it's avoiding a takeaway or avoiding a restaurant or entertaining friends and family then you might switch to some something a bit more refined a bit more special just to, as a treat and, and where, where do you position yourselves one of the things i find quite amusing as, as a sort of outsider looking in is when you see you know audi will talk about quality you know and you have waitrose talking about value and it's almost like everyone's trying to kind of do what everyone else is doing and and, and, and tesco you sort of do everything don't you so how do you position yourselves in the context of all that change that's going on around you that's the biggest question isn't it when you are a big retailer or a big brand in any market you tend to sit in the core center of whatever the the axes are yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Tesco covers everything. So yeah. you could say, are you really different, able to differentiate and be distinct? 
And I think there's a couple of things going on for us that are really, really important. The one is location. We do have more stores than anyone else and we have truly omni-channel presence. So however customers want to engage with us, they'll find the little store, the big store, anything in between and online, which is a very big, important one, both delivered, click and collect, but also in half an hour through Bush. So there's an element of infrastructure that is really, really important to be, you know, close to everyone. The other one is, yes, we need to offer the best pricing possible, not necessarily the lowest, but we need to have enough range of pricing in our stores so that our offer can be competitive. We need to have the best quality offers as well. And then I think the trick is to use the power of our segmentation that we can do through Clubcard data to offer exactly the relevant personalized let's say, propositions to each customer. So ideally, we want every person that shops at Tesco to know that that's just right for them. And that's what we can do at scale. Yeah, I love club club card data. Actually, I've used it as a customer, but as a yeah, as a supplier, not a customer. I've supplied Tesco before, and it's amazing compared to sort of like tracking data, where it takes months for any change to pop up. And then I've had club card data. It's like, oh, I can see last week people switching between this and that, and who it was, and the demographics is amazing. Like the the insight you get very quickly on club cards. The insight is very rich because we have this. It, it's at scale, so it's nationally representative of everyone and every sub segment that you want to cut every which way which is really great but also is very important is every week so the frequency of the shopping adds to the richness we also have tesco mobile and tesco bank which are in the uk and in some of the other countries so you can then see the customer from 360 how they use how they communicate how they manage their budgets what choices they make which is also very rich and insightful And then we can create all of those connections so that customers get the very best value from Tesco in terms of both price and quality that's right for them. And that's what's really quite unique. And we're excited because we're on a journey of personalization at scale that we're really maximizing digitization. All of that creates also an incredible opportunity for those supplier brands that we work with. You're right, actually. I remember when I used it, you, you can drill down so far, can't you? Which, Because of the number of people using it and the, the amount of people that might have brought, you know, brand A, let's say, um, assuming you've got reasonable penetration, you can really go down into geography and the type of person and what they also bought. And that's it's fascinating. Data. It's very insightful, yes. And, and it is truly um, representative of every postcode, yeah. basically, in which yeah. we are, which is really, really important. I, I, I almost used it actually as my overall brand tracker because what I actually found is that what happened in club card data happened in... Because it was so... It literally was the massive sample of the nation, really, in one, in, in one go, which is quite incredible. And I think the more we digitise that relationship the more we can become really relevant in the moment, not 12 weeks later, which is the other aspect of having the richness of the data. When it's digitized, you can be much more relevant in the moment where customers need it. And it can be in the moment for the brands as well. And also it can be through a channel that is very easy, you know, the tip of your phone. Our new app is now we have 10 million people digitized. And on a new app, you can shop online, shop in store, make a list, pay, check the stock, and order, click and collect, delivered or whoosh. Plus use all of uh, the same app for your vouchers, your points and redeem with your partner. So it's really becoming very powerful and very easy at the same time for the customers to access. Well, I suppose the other thing that's happened is, you know, you, you've come from brand owner, you're now working a retailer, but you're also a media owner, right? Because all that data and the various platforms you have. So how are you utilizing that, that as a media platform? Yeah, because of all the richness of that insight and our estate, which is both physical stores, but also online, we can sell the data and the media to our supplier brands partners in a way that they can reach the target much, much better in a more relevant way, much faster. And they can see the results, they can measure. So we really call it the retail uh, media and insight platform, which we power by via Dunhambi. We call it the biggest grocery closed loop media opportunity because everything you do can be targeted can be representative and more importantly can be measured right away in terms of sales and you don't have that divide between saying and doing you know claim behavior and real behavior you actually see your activities and the return on investment is much more targeted therefore which i think is really important at a time of cost of living crisis is not just for our customers it's for the companies as well so you want your budgets to go to the right people you don't want any wastage 
we can actually offer the audiences with partnership on television with ITV, for example, or Meta with Facebook. So there are ways in which you can go within both the Tesco environment, but also outside of that by creating special audiences. So we're really excited about that opportunity. That sounds amazing. Uh, you talk about cost of living crisis, so a, a really, really hot topic. And, and obviously the strap line you've had for a long time, every little helps. Now is the time for every little to help, really, isn't it? I mean, how, so how are you as Tesco responding to, you, you know, if I put it bluntly, you've probably got the biggest impact of any retailer in the country on what people spend day on day in day out and, and the ability to make a big difference so what, what, what is it you're doing to try and help the nation I'll start at a time of crisis helps yes. because i think is such a powerful it, you know it is part of the language and the culture in the country but it's also so important in terms of being relevant for whatever the season during the pandemic we were saying because right now every little helps during the cost of living crisis every little helps it really is the synonym of how we want to work being humble, but being there to be helpful. So that's our core brand essence. What we're actually doing during the cost of living crisis, we think we're actually being the most competitive in terms of price index we've ever been. And we have three mechanics that we deploy every day. The first one and most famous, I think, is the Aldi price match. We've identified that the value leader in the market is Aldi, and therefore we reassure our customers on over 700 products Every week they come, they won't find it cheaper at Aldi, which is, again, a little bit the leader in value terms. We also have a range of over a thousand products on low everyday prices. Those are the everyday essentials and they are now locked until September. So, again, giving stability of pricing is very important for customers, not just the low price, but the fact that it doesn't vary and go up and down every day. And I don't know if I can trust it. So we have low everyday prices on 700 lines, on 1,000 lines. And then the jewel in the crown is club car prices. This is really what has changed the way customers engage with us. All of our promotions and deals go through club car prices. It's over 8,000 lines. And what it's done is changed the perception of value because it's something I can use the club card and get instant value at shelf edge, which is what customers were asking us for. It was a very bold move which has now been followed in the market. But we are so excited about the opportunities that that gives us because it really increased the uh, penetration of Clubcard. But also the idea that through Clubcard you get true real value. So these three mechanics, which we've had now for three years, really are the backbone of our value proposition and help us be very close to the customers and what we can see what items they buy every week make sure that we are competitive there, that we communicate it, and at the same time be very consistent and very clear, which he- which is helpful. I presume that's the advantage of the club card data. You've got the data to see how people respond to the offers as well, and you can tweet them as, as you need to. How, one of the things with pricing is, is is there's the price and then there's the communication of the price, isn't there? And you've got three different tactics there. How do you decide how to communicate value? Because that must be a big challenge. Yes, and it's something we discuss every day and every week. But we, we've, we've got a model that we think works well. So we do b- two things. One is the distinct mechanics. We have kind of bursts when we know it really matters. Right now, you might have seen our new campaign called That's True Value. That's where we use the Aldi price match, but it's been reinforced with beautiful, fresh images of food that are hopefully uplifting and, and really yummy. It's still very important that we're buying food and bringing quality to it. Club car prices. We have a new campaign that's in the making. We've just tested it with System One. It's very promising and I'm very excited. It will come out in a couple of weeks. And that brings the excitement of the deal. So that's where you, the promotions are really the things you wouldn't normally buy. So are very exciting. They add to your basket if you want to do so at great prices. And low everyday price is kind of in the background is one of the, it's more of a reassurance of the white label rather than being something that should excite you. Now, during the cost of living uh, crisis, right at the beginning, we also created a campaign that clearly stated we want you to spend less with us, which was also, I think, very brave. I was particularly excited about that because, well, because it was brave to ask people to spend less with us. But obviously the reason was we believed that the three mechanics together were our very best value that they could find at Tesco. And we included all the savings you would get through Clubcard with Tesco Mobile, with fuel, with insurance, with banking, travel money, pet insurance. So we brought together the very best of Tesco under the banner of we want you to spend less with us. 
So we will we'll monitor and see how it works, but sometimes we'll be focused on one mechanic and others will bring them all together. I like that. It's a clever line, that. Spend less with us. It's quite surprising, isn't it? I can, yes. I can imagine people going, really? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it makes it has a double meaning, of course, it doesn't it? It has a double you know, meaning is, and it allowed us neat. enough for us to bring everything together and make it easier because right at the yeah. beginning, especially people's mental maths, you know, that you had to worry about the heating, the energy bills, the, the rent or the mortgage. The last thing we wanted was to make it complicated for customers. So we made it easier, say, we want you to spend less with us. These are all the reasons. Well, that's why I asked the question. Because I know if I just take my own habits, like I, I find it hard to do the maths or the conversion or have a reference point to how much do I spend in another chain of supermarkets. You know, it, it, it's quite confusing, isn't it, for, 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 for the consumer so, or customer. So, how, you know, it's about making it easy. Another question I want to ask you is, is how, you know, you've, you've created, we'll come on to talk about some of the advertising you've created as well. You've created some of the best brand advertising and price advertising as well. How do you make the decision about how much you spend on building a brand, you know, for long term versus activating the latest price offer? How do you get so the balance I'm right? a firm believer that all of it is brand and all of it needs to sell. I'd let, I talk about this with the team all the time. If we start ourselves dividing how we think about our investment and our communication one sells and the other one builds a brand one is short term the other one is long term we fail we need to be very commercially acute we need to be we're driving a business we're doing the best for our customers and the best for tesco and the only way is that every touch point sells and every touch point builds the brand that's super important, especially at Tesco, where the touch points are infinite, where yeah. the people working on the brands is a you know, large group of people. We need to make sure that's consistent, that brings the tone of voice of the brand, that is helpful, that things puts the customers at the center and is very competitive on pricing. So we don't think it like that. We'll, we'll go through the years and go, you know, is service more important? During COVID, service was much more important than pricing. You know, we didn't, everybody was just looking to feed their families or feed themselves. That was the most important thing. So opening hours, hygiene, safety, cleanliness, friendliness of the colleagues and supply were much more important. That's where we put the money than having the right price. We stopped all the promotions during COVID, um, but we started actually Aldi Price Masters after the first lockdown. So it really depends on the time. So it goes more with customer mindset and market dynamics, but all of it needs to sell. And all of it needs to build a brand. That's a really good point. In fact, we did we did do some research recently looking at long and the short. And actually, on our database, there's a lot of brand building campaigns that are very effective in the short term. It's much harder to do it the other way around. It's much harder to do an activation that also builds brand, but definitely the other way around works well. It's interesting. So I, I thought I'd pull off five of, of your recent adver advertising campaigns. We have a little chat. Well, so before we jump into it, actually, because I, I, I want to show the listeners and viewers some of your advertising and talk about it, which is always good fun. Um, you are right, actually, because what I noticed, the common theme in, it, in, in all of them was how well branded as Tesco. So almost immediately you've got a delivery driver pulling up or someone in uniform. All of them have delicious food, right? So you're kind of showing off the end result of, of a shop in Tesco. And all of them are memorable for different reasons. We'll come on and find out. But, but I, I can see how you're doing the the kind of the short and the long together in the same execution. And we've put pricing on all of our quality focus advertising and nice fresh food in all of our pricing, uh, you know, weekly trade support or, or the campaigns about cost of living. It's really important. The branding, I'm, I'm glad you say that because it's, it's quite important. <laughs> well, particularly in your category, well, right? Well, in all the categories. Which, which category yeah. is it not important to be well-branded? A few of your well competitors branded. do good food and do good price, right? You've got to go beyond yeah, that. We have to know. do it all. By being, you know, so big, we have to be distinctive by at least doing a good job for the yeah. brand and customers to make it really easy for them to yeah. choose. You know, they have no time. They have literally other things to think about than, our, than their own shopping. Now, what I thought would be fun about this, get, get talking about food love stories as well, which has been the campaign you've run for a few years now, is obviously you've got a responsibility to reach everybody, haven't you? Um, but you do it in a way that's very inclusive and diverse at the same time. I'd love to find out where that strategy came from and, and how that's going. So the strategy of food love story is a very simple one. At the core, the idea is you, we show you the food that you love to make for the people you love. That's it. And luckily, food at the core of everything we do is something that is also universally true. However you cook or not, or eat or not, whatever you like, food has a very important role in your life. 
And so that applies to everyone. And when we launched the campaign for Food Love Stories, we launched it in a very broad, universal way, depicting and reflecting the richness and diversity of the country to establish the idea. So I think we had, I don't know, 10, 20 executions at launch. And over the years, we've we've created more and more and more. And we've been able then to refine that story and create now what would be more of an in-depth look at one aspect, one segment of the population. You know, we, we pick the people who represent them uh, at best and really go under the skin. What is it that the food represents in their lives and how does it help them be together with the people they want to be with they love in a in a very broad sense it doesn't have to be a family necessarily it could be friends it could be anybody the most famous uh, initial ad we ever made was one called birdie where the lady had had 80 eight zero foster children eight eight and zero. every and every time she had in throughout her life every time she welcomed a new child at home she would make the same recipe which was her jerk chicken and that was a story of love and the, the whole ad, she had, we had Birdie saying she was a... Re, the real Birdie was actually in the ad, which is a rare occasion. <laughs> she was amazing. She was saying, because, you know, food is love. And and that's really encapsulating the idea, how it started and then how it's going, <laughs> which is going really well and much more focused on different segments of the population to tell the true well, story. Let's jump into a few of these. Because I think what you've described is exactly what we're seeing as, as we kind of measure the effectiveness of it, because... Everyone tells a different story, but in, in there's a common thread for all of these, isn't it? The importance of the food, bringing people together, and there's a beautiful human truth that sits at the heart of all of us. So what I thought I'd do, let, let, I mean, these are just five I've picked out, but five great examples from our database. would love to talk through each one. Let's just jump to those now. Now, I've chosen this one for a very specific reason. So a few, about three years ago, Kate, wonderful Kate Waters at ITV, who I know we both know well, um, she and I wanted to look at uh, diverse ads and we had two questions, really. We wanted firstly to find out how does the audience represented feel when they see themselves in advertising, but how does everyone else feel as well? Because actually advertisers are starting to ask the question, well, if I tell the story of this, what might be seen as a minority or niche group, what does that mean for everyone else? Are we going to alienate people, I guess, in the, in the extreme? And we wanted to kind of prove that actually no diverse advertising unites a nation. And that was kind of the hypothesis we went in. And we were thrilled to find out that actually when we, when we tested... Or we, we picked a sample of 30 ads, diverse in, in and of themselves. In the vast majority of cases, we saw what we called a diversity dividend. That actually what happened is not only was the ad liked by everybody, but for the audience represented, you saw this boost. And what was really one of the, we, we actually picked this ad because it represented a number of things. It represented the diversity dividend firstly. But also what we noticed actually is that the age, British Asian audience, who let's remember not that niche, right? You know, I think about seven or eight percent of the population, you know, there are very, very, very few adverts featuring Asian people, right? And this beautifully did it. And, and it was a wonderful example of what we call the diverse dividend. So on the system one five point scale, the nat rep or the general audience, this this scored about three and a half, which is above average and, and a good performance, but it boosted up right up to five star. And what we saw, which is magical, is that it produced more happiness. The, the strength of that feeling was greater and the reasons people gave for emotion. It was like, oh, I've never seen myself in an advert before. And, oh, look, that, that's the chicken we have as well. You know, that sort of thing. But anyway, I thought I'd play it. I'd love to hear your kind of, uh, you know, your, your, your telling the story on it. So here we go. For everyone listening, uh, this is the Tesco food love story, Auntie's Sumac Chicken. If we can't go to Auntie's to break fast, let's go go see that chicken ourselves. <laughs> I mean, there's so there's so much in that, you know, but but I think you've got the the brothers there are amazing actors. Are, are they? Are they? They're are they? Are they brothers. real? They're, they're actual they're brothers. brothers. Yes, they they were brothers. This was shot during the pandemic. This was a time where we were making about a, a new ad every week. Every week. Yes, for wow. the first few weeks we did, and um, we really wanted to show. Was during Ramadan. We were all in lockdown, and we thought. I think it was through a colleague. We we finally understood, like many other families, actually, big, you know, that they had never cooked the meal themselves because it was their auntie they would normally go to their relatives to celebrate 
And so we thought it would be great to show how they could do it themselves. So they had the recipe that the auntie had written down. They shot themselves with a phone. This was, you know, we sent some phones during lockdown and um, sent some camera and shot it. And then we connected. And of course, we edited afterwards. But it was a true story. They had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> we had to send a chicken, I think, at the end. But it was a beautiful way of showing how people were just, you know, ingenuity during those days. We were all doing different things that we'd never done before. And it was, a, I think, a very natural and authentic way of showing, you yeah, know, during the Ramadan, what, you know, how families. It's beautifully authentic. But the other thing about it is it's very relatable. Like everybody can relate to the, the idea of having to find, figure things out in the kitchen. You have to phone your auntie to go, how did, how am I supposed to do this? It, it's, what I love about it, the universal truth, even though it is, you know, Ramadan, it was in lockdown, it's three brothers, it's, it, you know, an Asian audience. Actually, it's universal at the same time. That's what's lovely about the kind of, you know, And the, the we results. were very excited with the results. It was the first time we dedicated a, a, a video to Ramadan. We normally would have a different presence. Like you say, we decided that the population that we serve is big enough to deserve it. And actually, it's a big cultural moment. And it's something we are very keen to continue to be really the, the grocer that represents all of the big cultural moments for the different parts of the population at best. Well, that brings me nice on to Eid, actually, because, of course, that, that's, that's uh, a more recent one. But let's also play that as well so everyone can uh, listen to this one. Another, another, this is another amazing result, actually, where very similar result, actually, mid three stars. But this actually tops our system in terms of scoring. So 5.9 is the maximum score. This one got a 5.9. Let me play this for everyone listening and watching. It's all day celebrating Eid this weekend. Here's an extra special edition of Food Love Stories. Eid Mubarak from ITV and Tesco. Uh-uh-uh, <laughs> not yet. Who's got the moon? <laughs> Has confirmed the sighting of a new moon, Eid Mubarak. Quality ingredients for special moments. Where's Uma? There you are. It's a new moon, Eid Mubarak. Food love stories brought to you by Tesco. That's beautiful, isn't it? I, I love, you know, the, the betweenness between the people. You know, obviously you've got the food in there, but I love the way you cast the boy. That's yeah, casting lovely. is very important yeah. all the time, isn't it? And I think one of the criteria and the efforts that we really put is to make sure that when we develop scripts, we are truly inclusive and representative of the different parts of the country throughout the process. So from the creative team to the directors to the photographer, we use our networks of colleagues as well quite a lot to test a lot of the ideas and and always ask the question is this authentic is it how it happened is this how it feels so that our ads are not just tokenistically diverse you know you put a person of this you know yeah. uh, physical appearance but actually represent the cultural moment and what i love here is the little boy is the fact that he wants to steal a little something and then the mother gives him something to eat you know that they do do that and then the hubbub of the family when they all join and everyone gets distracted and there's lots of voices. Sounds a bit like an Italian family, I have to say. Cooking together on a Sunday, similar. And then again, trying to find the boy and, and the food uniting everyone. It's um, little touches, but we really try to do it in a very well, authentic your way. Your Italian comment's spot on, isn't it? Because there's much more that unites us than divides us. And I think we forget that. But, you know, we, we can all see ourselves in a way. And the little touches as well, like the the, the boy making out a toilet roll, you know, toilet right. roll um, uh, to holders see, to, to see. Look for the moon. Look for the moon, you know. And then the radio announcing uh, from the mosque and then the shoes, of course. I mean, there, there are things that are more obvious and others that are less obvious. But we try to do it in a truthful way. That's a wonderful, wonderful example. I wanted to, to move on and talk about, I know one you, you and I have talked a lot about, uh, Sue's Crispy Pork yeah. Noodles, also known as the Blue Tits, of course. So j j just for everyone listening and watching, I'll just get it up now. But tell me the background to this one, because in the research we've done together with ITV, we noticed there's a big segment of the population often missing which is older people and this is a lovely example but i'd love to tell me the background to how this so one the came about. story here goes that we were developing two to four new food love stories we decided we'd do a batch but like batch cooking and we wanted to really pick different moments different segments of the populations and develop them together 
And the team had done a wonderful job, as always, with BBH, our creative agency, and come up with four or five stories, of which this was one. And when the team presented it internally, they talked about these older women that were, you know, a part of a swim club, which were inspired by the true, the blue tits swimming club, <laughs> where these ladies meet once a week or once a month and they go swimming and have lovely food uh, together. So that was the inspiration. And I remember, and I shared this with you before, I remember they were talking and I said, but how old are these women, older women? And I think they mentioned the age, which was very much my age or thereabout. And I was like, Okay, I think you're depicting them in all the wrong ways because those are me and I'm not like that. (laughs) Stop calling them. They may be older, but not old. And there's a vibrancy, I think, in the the final ad when we'll show it, you will see that there's a vibrancy and an energy, a love for each other, for the chit-chat, for celebrating food and being together and having a great time which I think speaks to some of the points we'll talk about. Well, let's play it so everyone can uh, have a listen or have a watch if you're watching on YouTube. Okay, here we go. Sue's crispy pork noodles. It's become a bit of a tradition over the years, my crispy pork noodles. The secret is getting the crackling extra crispy. The girls love it after a... We may have met swimming, right, lunch. but we became friends over our love of great food. Come together and enjoy our Tesco finest pork loin joint. Food love stories brought to you by Tesco. Now, a little interesting uh, fact here, because again, in our partnership with ITV, looking at diversity, we, we commissioned a, a study called Wise Up, which is looking at how older people feel in advertising. And um, all our series on diversity is called Feeling Seen because we see this diversity dividend. We see an uplift when when people see themselves advertising. The one audience where that's not true are older people. Actually, you don't see being represented isn't enough. You actually need to represent in the right kind of way. It was fascinating, actually. But, you know, older people don't want to be seen as an afterthought or as, you know, being there, done that, you know, they're kind of like, you know, retired now. So back to your point, actually, about, you know, older, not not necessarily old, still want to be, you know, still playing active part in society. But the things, the themes that came across is, you know, friendship, being together. Those are really important things. Being seen as still active and doing fun things. Having and you fun land and that laughing. brilliantly. And, and the humour and the fun as well, which you get absolutely, you know, in spades in this. I mean, you know, I don't qualify, but I would love to join them. You know, to be mean? their friends. I, I know think you want I, to be part of it. What I love you? about it is uh, most people would go, I'd like to be with them and yeah. be their friends. I, I, I would even go swimming, yeah. you know, in cold water if, if it was cold. And I'd love to, to yeah. cook with them and, and chat with them. And I think that's why it was successful, because it was more than showing older people exactly. having nice food. It was showing the true spirit of these group of friends. Make them the hero. Make them the hero of the show rather than the extra, the grandparents that, you know, are in the background or something that you might see or they're, they're on a cruise ship clearly, you know, using up their, you know, their, their pension or whatever. But but as the centre of the action, I think, is is wonderful here. Now, am I right in saying they were real blue tits? They're not actors in this case. They are the real blue tits. So they're tits. mixed. Right? There are some yeah. actors and some real ladies from the blue tits group. Um, See, I'm laughing cast. just hearing about this. Yes, <laughs> I know the name. <laughs> and we have a wonderful video as well, which you may want to show where Now describe they were what shown. you're doing here because this so is quite we, amusing. We show, them, we show the actual, all of them, the blue tits uh, group. The, ad, the final ad where some of them could see themselves and others could see how we depicted the situation. And we have a lovely video of, of them seeing it for the first time. And I think it just gives you the idea of how, hopefully, how much we centred in terms of capturing the real spirit, what they loved about it. I mean, that that is so much fun isn't it like just seeing the reaction on their faces to seeing themselves in advertising it must be quite a moment to it think. is a moment You're in a tesco ad it is, right because normally you do all of this you think it through you know the team is wonderful working on food life stories in all of our campaigns you know i'm blessed with the best team possible they really think it through they're really trying to do what's authentic what's true you know interrogating the script but when you see it then on the faces of the people who are the most interested the biggest vested interest because it's them you want to represent them in the right way and you see that reaction it just fills you with joy and satisfaction and pride that we've hit the mark we're telling a true story 
we're doing we're doing it in a way that's motivating, high energy, and hopefully we'll inspire people to cook a little totally. bit more. And, and you're creating well. emotion, aren't you? The real yeah. emotion there, isn't there? Which is yeah. wonderful to see. One of the other ads I thought particularly impressive, and I think this was one of the highest scoring actually on the database, is Helen's Homecoming Lamb. So let me just get this one up as well. Uh, this is a lovely example because I think what this shows really well is that how you pick lots of different situations haven't you and represent all the man you know all the different variety of life and and different situations so let me get this one up now so here we go helen's homecoming lamb it was hard when the boys went off to college i used to love cooking sunday roasts all the family around the table i really miss it my salsa verde crusted leg of lamb was their favorite it's good to have them back for a couple of weeks. Food love stories brought to you by Tesco. So again, you got you, 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 there's a scene there we can all relate to, right? You know, if we have families, you know, that, that's a kind of familiar scene. But you've got the the lovely kind of family situation. You've also showed the food off in a very natural setting as well. And there's some humour there as well. So again, capturing emotion. One of our most enduring uh, food love stories, we've used it several years, two or three years in a row, because it still worked really well. And it captures that moment, isn't it? The homecoming. And I think my reflection is both as a parent or as a child, you want to be part of that family, that atmosphere which is not too artif- artificial it is you know there's a little bit of humor and the food that once again you know brings it brings all together, together. Yeah. and so that's the role that we play but yeah one of the yeah. nice no i love i love that well. i can see that both ways it is apparent myself i can imagine that feeling of you know kids being away coming yeah. back how excited you'd be and then equally as remembering back to when I was, you know, when I was younger and left home and I was coming home and that warmth of, oh, yeah, I'm going to get mum's cooking again. And the smell again. of mum's cooking and the smell or dad's and the, cooking and or you whoever's relax cooking. And it's all being done for you and all that stuff. For two weeks. Yeah, for two, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant, isn't it? Both ways, I think. Now, you've got a new campaign coming out as well, haven't you? Which, when this airs, might even have actually, you know, gone it on will TV. Have gone on air. will have gone on air. So talk me through this one, because, again, I think you've done another... This is another, um, I think, winning ad that scored uh, in a four-star as well. But comes at it from a slightly different angle as well. Another sort of... Which I think, as well, represents an audience maybe that aren't represented very well at the moment. Let's play this, and then I'd love to hear more about it. I'll see you next week. Can we have a barbecue? I could pop to Tesco. Sorry. We'll come. Hey, is that the salad? Yeah. Pre-marinated and ready to go. Yeah. Tesco fire pit barbecue range. What? <laughs> and we do this every day. At least that's dinner sorted. It's very moving, isn't it? And And, and I think probably... That situation affects more of us than maybe we realise. We we hear or we see the statistic from the ONS that says at least two and a half million families in the UK are co-parenting families with at least four million children part of those families. I I consider this a love story. It's a story of love for your children. It's a story of a child love for um, her parents. And regardless of the situation in which the parents find themselves, they show that love united by the fire pit range from Tesco. And again, you know, it's during a time summer when people want to have quick solutions. They don't want to cook too much. It's too hot. It's been very warm. So we do all the hard work for you. So there's the time for that message from the product. But it's also the natural instinct of a child wanted to bring the parents together and then kind of having great time because after all, it's just a day, it's just a barbecue. Um, it touches a nerve. And again, we've we've tested it with our own colleagues in the carers and parents network first to just get the accent right, to get the nuances right or what the, a child might truly be saying and how a parent might feel. And we know there's some raw emotion, emotions in there, but hopefully that will touch a nerve in a good way. I, exactly. I mean, the people I've uh, shown this to who are co-parenting in that scenario, it really did, it was, it, it, in a positive way, did trigger all those all those emotions. So it did do that. And as we know from the testing, the broad sample of, of, of the nation scored, you know, four, four star is, is pretty impressive as well. So it's, it, it gives us an, in, everyone can have an insight into that. Kind of, that. I think that's what I admire about the work you do is you tell very specific stories. You tell one person's story in a way that everyone can relate to. And if you can get that right, then you get, you've got something quite powerful. 
And I think working with System One, we're kind of learning together, aren't we? We're learning to co-create, to create our and craft our stories and scripts, test them, learn how to make it work. Those emotions are very nuanced and it's important to get it right as much as we can. You know, it's impossible to please absolutely everyone, but we want to make sure that we, we are truthful to that emotion and we speak to the people who know and that everyone else can understand and can relate to it, whether they're part of that situation or not. And we are helped by the system one methodologies to really get to the right emotions. Almost out of time. So I thought I'd, I also wanted to ask you about the Ad Association, of course, yes. because you're president. Yes. Right? So quickly tell me about your role there and also what, what's most important to you in terms of, as you, I guess, in, in that role, look at how our industry does things. What's, what's really important to, to you there? So I'm president of the Council of the Advertising Association. Of course, we have an amazing CEO and executive team and a great board chaired by Dame Annette King, who just received the honours. I'm so proud and excited for her. And they set the strategy and the activities that the Ad Association will do on behalf of an industry. In the council, we have all of the bodies represented in the association. And our job is to make sure, first of all, that we represent the industry at its best. That we are mantras that we want this industry to be more inclusive, more representative, more sustainable, more responsible. And that's really, if you want in a nutshell, what we do. So... The agenda of my presidency has been all around talent because the industry employs about 360,000 people, which incidentally is almost by the number the same people as Tesco. So together, it's quite a lot of people, but it gives indirectly work to over a million people. It's one of the biggest advertising market in the world. We export more than anyone else in proportion to the size of our country. And we are considered in this country one of the creative hubs of the world. So it's a very important industry that creates work, opportunities, employment, but we have some talent issues that we needed to address. Um, we also are the first ones who created the Ad Net Zero initiative, which is the opportunity to really measure the impact of all of the advertising communication chain in terms of you know, carbon emissions and measurement. And that's being absolutely crucial to the success, both of the industry, but also we're exporting it in other markets. And then we lobby with the government so that the communication, the industry can be fair and representative and balanced. And obviously we, you know, interact with all the different parts of the government in terms of policy setting, representing the all of the bodies of the in industry. So it's a very multifaceted um, aspect of what we do. The All In Census has been just released, the second round of it, over 17,000 people. This is the largest survey for diversity and inclusion of any country, oh, really? of wow. any industry. So it's really, really representative, some magnificent and interesting insights about the opportunities, the advantages of working in, in this industry, which is, of course, media, advertising agency and the market is. And it's really the, the core of the insight for our activities going forward. So really excited. They do a magnificent job. I'm honoured to be their president, but they do all the hard work, all the great work. Brilliant. So ladies and gentlemen, do, do look up the Ad Association and find Absolutely. out what they're doing and get involved, of course, be, yeah. if you can. Alessandra, thank you so much. It's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to The Uncensored CMO. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed doing the interview. If you'd like to never miss an episode again, please do subscribe. Uh, you can do that wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to watch on YouTube, go and hit the subscribe button there too. You can follow me at John Evans over at Twitter or on LinkedIn where I am under John Evans. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.